I believe we are live. Welcome back once again. This is the moon of Israel. Yep, 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 yep. Thank you for joining us. Like I said, I used to do this a while ago, reading and I think just doing the research uh, for uh, the R. Kelly narrative <laughs> and just doing the R. Kelly unraveling and having to listen to reading. I remember, it. you know, I kind of miss it a little bit. You know what I mean? So I did a little bit of the uh, reading before and a little lighthearted. And I, and I remember why I stopped because this stuff could be heavy, but we cannot stop now. So we are going to get in chapter two. This is kind of a long book. We are here because we just started and it is here. So, and I have a little bit of time this week. So I'm using my time uh, wisely. And I said, hey, why not share with the new subscribers who may not have known about the Left Project. And since it's the Black History Month, let's get a little bit of history, okay? Let's get a little bit of history, but I'm going to break it up because I did re remember reading straight will have your voice jacked up. It will have you jacked up. All righty. Tell a friend, tell a friend and share. Now, if you are just joining us and you had an opportunity to listen to chapter one, chapter one was wild. We're just going to do a little bit of recap. This is coming of age in Mississippi. It's the autobiography of growing up poor and black in the rural South. This is Ann Moody. Um, she was in, her family lived on a plantation still in the 50s and 40s. They were living in a plantation. I assume they were sharecropping. Um, they were leaving their children in the care of younger children, not that much older than them. Many times they didn't have a choice or sickly elders. Um, the crop wasn't good. The mother was pregnant. The father shipped her off. He started messing around with the, uh, the long haired uh, uh, neighbor. And he tried to come back one or two times and the mother was not having it. She wasn't that type to say, hey, you know, I'll keep taking you back. I'll keep taking you back. And so the story is being told from Ann Moody's perspective. And so now we're at chapter two. Oh yeah, and the little bad behind boy tried to burn down the house and got her beaten. What's his name again? George Lee. Little bad behind George Lee tried to burn down the house and the father beat, beat her and all type of things happening there. Chapter two. That was the moon version of the recap. All right. Now that school was out and there was no one for us to stay with, we would sit on the porch and rock in the rocking chair most of the day. We were scared to go out and play because of the snakes. Often as we sat on the porch, we saw them coming up to the hill from the swamp. Sometimes they would just go to the other side of the swamp, but other times they went under the house and we didn't see them come out. When this happened, we wouldn't eat all day because we'd be scared to go inside. The snakes often came into the house. Once I was putting wood in the stove for mama, I almost put my hands on one curled up under the wood. I never touched the wood pile again. One day we heard Mrs. Cook's dog barking down beside the swamp at the base of the cornfield. We ran out to see what happened. And when we got there, the dog was standing still with his tail straight up in the air, barking hysterically. There lying beside a log was a big old snake with fishy scales all over his body. Adeline, Julie, and I stood there in a trance looking at it, too scared to move. We had never seen one like it, like this. It was so big, it didn't even look like a snake. It looked like it was big enough to swallow us whole. Finally, the snake slowly made its way back into the swamp, leaving a trail of mashed down grass behind it. When mama came home that evening from the cafe, we told her about the snake. So again, these children are being left in the house. And this is, so this latchkey thought process, I mean, is not a new one, okay? She had no one to leave them with and school was kind of like the surrogate babysitter. And once that were out, the children were kind of on their own. At first, she didn't believe us, but we were shaking so that she had us go out back and show her where she, we had seen it. After she saw the place next to the log where it had been lying and the trail it left going into the swamp, she went and got Mr. Cook. For days, Mr. Cook and some other men looked in the swamp for the snake, but they never did find it. 
After that, mama was scared for us to stay at home alone. And she began looking for a house in closer in town, closer to where we worked. She worked. She's like blinky snakes that ding, big might come up here and eat y'all up while I'm at work, she said. In the meantime, she got Uncle Ed, whom we liked so much, to come over and look over after us every day. Sometimes he would take us hunting. Then we wouldn't have to sit on the porch and watch those snakes in the boiling hot summer sun. Ed, Ed made us a, a nega shooter. <laughs> okay, Ed. He made us a, a ninka shooter eat. This was a little slingshot made out of a piece of leather connected to a fork stick by a thin slab of rubber. We would take rocks and shoot them at birds and anything else we saw. Ed was the only one who ever killed anything. He always carried salt and matches in his pocket and when he'd kill a bird, he'd pick it and roast it right there in the woods. Sometimes Ed took us fishing too. He knew every creek in the whole area and we'd roam for miles. Whenever he caught a fish, he'd scrape and cook them right on the bank of the creek. On those days, we didn't have to eat that hard, corn, cold pone of bread mama left for us. Sometimes Ed would keep us in the woods all day and we and we wouldn't hunt birds or fish or anything. We'd just walk listening to the birds and watching the squirrels leap from tree to tree and the rabbits jumping behind the little stumps. Ed had a way of making you feel so much a part of everything about the woods. He used to point out all the trees to us, telling us what was oak and which was pine and which bore fruit. He'd even give us quizzes to see if we would remember one tree from another. I thought he was the smartest man person in the whole world. Sorry, not man. I thought he was the smartest person in the whole world. One day, Ed was late coming and he had resigned ourselves. Sorry, we had resigned ourselves to spend the whole day on the porch. We rocked for hours in the sun and finally fell asleep. Eventually, Ed came. He locked the house up and immediately rushed us off the porch. He told us he was going to surprise us. I thought we were going to a new creek or something. So I begged him to tell us, tell me. He saw that I was upset, so finally he told me he was taking us home with him. As we walked down the rock road, it occurred to me that I'd never been home with Ed, and I was dying to see where he lived. I could only remember seeing Grandma Winnie once, when she came to our house just after Junior was born. Mama never visited Grandma because they didn't get along that well. Grandma had talked Mama into marrying my daddy when Mama went to marry someone else. She wanted to marry someone else. Now that mom and daddy had separated, she didn't want anything to do with grandma, especially when she learned that her old boyfriend was married and living in Chicago. So mama was in her feelings. Ed told us that he didn't live very far from us, but walked barefoot on the rock road in the boiling hot sun. I began to wonder how far was not very far. Ed had how much more longer we got to go. These rocks is burning my feet, I said. Ain't much further, just right around the bend. Ed yelled back at me. Why didn't you put them shoes on? I told you them rocks was hot. He waited on me now. Ought to make you go all the way back to the house and put them shoes on. You're going to be lagging behind back, and we ain't never going to make it forward. Too sweet, get off of work. Mama told us we ain't supposed to wear our shoes out around the house. You know we ain't got but one pair, and then my shoes, school shoes. Here it is, right here, Ed said at last. As he may run up front and open the gate. By this time, he was carrying Junior on his back and Adelaide half asleep on his hip. I ran to the gate and opened it and rode on it as it swung open. We entered a green pasture with lots of cows. Is this where you stay? I asked Ed as I pointed to an old wooden house on the side of the hill. Is any more houses down here? Ed said, laughing at me. See the pond over there, Essie He called as I ran down the hill. I'm going to bring y'all fishing over there one day. Boy, they got some big fishes in there. You should have seen that salmon water caught, what salmon water caught yesterday. I glanced at the pond, but ran past it. I didn't have my mind fishing at all. I was dying to see Grandma Winnie's house and salmon water, Ed's younger brother, and his sister, Alberta, who I'd never met. Ed had told me that George Lee was now living with his daddy and stepmother. I was glad because I didn't want to run into him then. Alberta was standing in the yard at the side of the house, feeding the big fire around the wash pot with kindling. Two white boys about my size stood at her side. I looked around for Sam and Walter, but I didn't see them. Ed, what took you so long? I ought to make you tote that water for you left here. Alberta showed that Ed as he turned and saw us. I had to tote out Adeline and Junior all the way here. You must think I'm Superman or something, Ed answered angrily. I ain't asked you what you is. You just get the bucket and fill the rinse tub 
up full of water, Alberta shouted. Sam, you and Essie may help Ed with that water and Walter take Adeline and Junior on the porch out of the way. I stood dead in my tracks with my mouth wide open as the two white boys jumped with Alberta, yelled Sam and Walter's name. One boy ran to the wash bench against the house and got a bucket and the other picked up Junior, took Adeline by the hand and carried them on the porch. Essie May, didn't I tell you help Sam and Ed with the water? Alberta yelled at me. Where is Sam and Walter? I asked with my eyes focused on white boys on the porch with Adelina Jr. Is you blind or something? Get the bucket and help tote that water, Alberta yelled. I turned my head look, to look for Ed. He was headed for the pond in front of the house with a bucket in his hand. Ed, I shouted, still in a state of shock. He turned and looked at me. I stood there looking from Ed to the white boys and back to Ed again. Without saying anything, Ed opened up his mouth to speak, but no words came. A deep expression of hurt crossed his face. For a second, he dropped his head to avoid my eyes. Then he walked towards me. He picked up another bucket and handed it to me. Then he took me by the hand and led me to the pond. As we walked towards the pond, one of the white boys ran ahead of us. White boys, I put in quotation. He climbed through the barbed wire fence right be below the levee of the pond. Then he turned and pushed a button sorry, the bottom strand of the wire down to the ground with his foot and held the middle strand up with his hands so Ed and I could walk through. I began to pull back from Ed, but he clutched my hand even harder and led me toward the fence as we ducked under. I brushed against the white boy, jerking back. I caught my hand, my hair in the barbed wire overhead. Essie may watch your head for you get cut. Wait, wait, you got your hair cut, the white boy said as he quickly and gently untangled my hair from the wire. Then he picked up the bucket I had dropped and handed it to me. Ed didn't say one word as he stood beside the fence watching us. The white boy caught my, me by the hand and attempted to pull me up the levee of the pond. I pulled back. I, still holding my hand, he stopped and stared at me puzzled. Come on, Essie May, yeah, Ed, giving me a, it's okay. Stupid. They just mean. Look as he ran up the levee past us. Then the white boy and I followed Ed up the hill holding hands. As we towed the water from the pond, I kept watching the white boys and listening to Alberta and Ed call them Sam and Walter. I noticed that they treated them just like they treated me. And the white boy called Sam was nice to me, just like Ed. He kept telling me about the fish he and Walter had caught and I should come and fish with them sometimes. After we finished towing the water, we went on the porch where Adeline, Junior, and Walter sat. Adeline had a funny look on her face. I could tell she was thinking about Sam and Walter too. Because remember, they're in the segregated South. It's Mississippi. You got to be the, probably like the 40s. And they're seeing these Europeans taking command from their melanated family members, right? Before the evening was over, I finally realized that the two boys actually were Ed's brothers. But how Ed got two white brothers worried me. How did Ed get two white brothers? Some so called. On our way back home, Ed carried us through the woods. As we walked, he talked and talked about the birds, the trees, and everything else he could think of without letting me say a word. I knew he didn't want to talk about Sam and Walter, so I didn't say anything. I just walked and listened. I thought about Sam and Walter so much that night, it gave me a headache. Then I finally asked mama, mama, uh, them two boys over at Winnie's. Ed say they is his brother. Is they your brothers? What boys, mama asked. Over at Winnie's, they got two boys living with her about my size and they's the same color as Miss Cook. What did y'all do? What did y'all do over Winnie's today? Was Winnie home? Mama asked us if she hadn't heard me. No, she was at work. Wasn't nobody there but Alberta and those two boys. What was Alberta doing, Mama asked. She was washing and we towed the water from the pond for her. Them boys are some nice. And they say they is kin to us. Ain't they your brothers, Mama? Look, don't, don't you be so stupid. If they's Winnie's children and I'm Winnie's too, don't that make us sisters and brothers? Mama shouted at me. Oh, are you shouting out the five-year-old or the six-year-old about how stupid she is? Like, but how come they look like Miss Cook and Winnie? Ain't that color? Ain't that color in Alberta? Ain't that color in you? Oh, but how come they look like Mrs. Cook and 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 Winnie ain't that color and Alberta ain't that color and you? Cause us daddy ain't that color. Now you shut up. Oh gosh, I'm gonna. Why you gotta know so much all the time? I told Ed not to talk, take y'all to Winnie, she shouted. Mama was so mad that I was scared. If I asked her anything else, she might hit me, so I shut up. But she hadn't nearly satisfied my curiosity at all. While Mama was working at the cafe in town, she began to get fat. 
she often told us how much she would could eat while she was working. So I didn't think anything of her slowly growing little pot, little pot. But one day after taking a good look, I noticed it wasn't a little pot anymore. And I knew she was going to have a baby. She cried just about every night. Then she would get up sick every morning. She didn't stop working until a week before the baby was born. And she was out of work only three weeks. She went right back to the cafe. Who is looking after all of these children? Question. For those who just joined us, we are reading from Coming of Age in Mississippi, a book by Ann Moody, the classic autobiography of growing up poor and black in the rural South. So mama is lumped up again. And mama got a bad attitude. And mama didn't have much of a maternity leave. Let's go. Mama called the baby James. His daddy was a soldier. One day the soldier and his mother came to get him. They were real yellow people. The, the only Negro near their color I had ever seen was Florence. That's the lady my daddy was now living with. So daddy go shock up with Florence. The soldier's mother was a stout lady with long, thin, straight black hair and very thin lips. She looked like a slightly tanned white woman. Mama called her Miss Pearl. And all the time they were in the house, Mama acted as though she was scared of them. She smiled a couple of times when they made general comments about the baby, but I could tell she didn't mean it. Just before the soldier and Miss Pearl left, Miss Pearl turned to Mama and said, you can't work and feed other children and keep this baby too. I guess Mama did want to keep the little boy. So, so, so she looked sad. So I thought she was going to cry, but she didn't say anything. Miss Pearl must have seen how mama looked too. You can stop in to see the baby when you are in town sometimes, she said. Then she and the soldier took him and drove away in their car. Mama cried all night. And she kept saying bad things about some Raymond. I figured that was the name of the soldier who gave her the baby. So uh, a lot of times uh, back in the day, grandparents would be surrogate parents for children, um, whether the parent was incapable or the parent just left the child on them. And so the grandmother looked, she just housed the whole baby. At the end of the summer, mama found it necessary for us to move into town in Centerville where she worked. This time we moved into a two room house that was twice the size of the other one. It was next to her, it was next to where a very poor white family lived in a large green frame house. It was also located on one of the main roads branching off Highway 24, running into Centerville. We were now a little less than a mile from the school that I was to attend, which was the same road as our house. It was on the same road. Here we had a sidewalk for the first time. It extended from town all the way to, where, to school where it ended. I was glad we lived on the sidewalk side of the road. Between the sidewalk and our house, the topsoil was sand and two feet deep. We were the only ones with clean white sand in our yard, and it seemed beautiful and special. There was even more sand for us to play in a large vacant lot on the other side of our house. The white people living next door, next to us, only had green grass in their yard, just like everyone else. A few weeks after we moved there, I was in school again. I was now six years old and in the second grade, so her she was getting cursed out, and she's just a little bitty thing. But she just only turned sixth grade. I was now six years old and in the second grade. At first, it was like being in heaven to have less than a mile to walk to school and having a sidewalk from our house all the way there made things even better. I was going to Willis High, the only Negro school in Centerville. It was named for Mr. C.H. Willis, its principal and founder, and had only been expanded into a high school the year before I started there. Before Mr. Willis came to town, the eighth grade had been the limit of schooling for the Negro children in Centerville. For the first month that I was in school, a Negro family across the street kept Adeline and Junior. But after mama had them stay at home alone, dang moms. But after that, mama had them stay at home alone. And every hour or so until I came home, the lady across the street would come down and look in on them. One day when I came home from school, Adeline and Junior were naked, playing in the sand in the front of our house. All the children who lived in town used that sidewalk that passed our house. When they saw Adeline and Junior sitting in the sand naked, they started laughing and making fun of them. I was ashamed to go in the house or recognize Adeline and Junior as my little sister and brother. If you're six, I 
I had never felt that way before. I got mad at mama because she had to work and couldn't take care of Adeline and Junior herself. Every day after that, I hated the sand in front of the house. Before school was out, we moved again and I was glad. It seems as though we were always moving. Every time it was to a house on some white man's plates and every time it was a room and a kitchen. The new place was much smaller than the last one. Sorry, but it was nicer. Here we had a large pasture to play in that was dry, flat, and always closely cropped because of the cattle. Mama still worked at the cafe, but now she had someone to keep Adeline and Junior until I came home from school. One day shortly after Christmas, Junior set the house on fire. Father help me. What kind of house? Listen, I just have that. He was playing in the front yard. He had a small round tin heater in there, and Junior raked red hot coals out of, of it onto the floor and pushed them against the wall. I was washing dishes in the kitchen when I looked up and saw flames leaping towards the ceiling. I ran to get Junior. The house had loose newspaper tacked to the walls and was built out of old dried lumber. It was burning fast. After I had carried Junior outside, I took them and Adeline up on a hill a little distance away. This is like the second time, dude, she's only six. The whole house was blazing now. I stood there with Junior on my hip and holding Adeline by the hand, and suddenly I thought about the new clothes Mama had bought us for Christmas. These were the first she had ever bought us. All our other clothes had been given to us. I had to get them. I left Adeline and Junior on the hill and ran back to the house. I opened the kitchen door and was about to crawl in to the flames and smoke when a neighbor grabbed me and jerked me out. Just as she pulled me away, the roof fell in. I stood there beside her with tears running down my face and watched the house burn to the ground. All our new Christmas clothes were gone, burnt to ashes. We had only lived there for a few months, and now we moved again to another two-room house off a long rock road. This time, Mama quit the job at the cafe to do domestic work for a white family. We lived in their maid's quarters since Mama made only $5 a week. The white woman she worked for let us live in the house free. Mama's job was now close to home and she could watch Adeline and Junior herself. Sometimes Mama would bring us the white family's leftovers. It was the best food I had ever eaten. That was when I discovered that white folks ate different from us. They had all kinds of different foods with meat and all. We always had just beans and bread. One Saturday, the white lady let Mama bring us to her house. We sat on the back porch until the white family finished eating. Then Mama brought us in the house and sat us at the table and we finished up the food. It was the first time I had seen the inside of a, a white family's kitchen. The kitchen was pretty, all white and shiny. Mama had cooked that meal we were eating too. If Mama only had a kitchen like this of her own, I thought she would cook better food for us. Mama was still seeing Raymond, the soldier she had the baby for. Now we were living right up the road about a mile from Miss Pearl. Raymond started coming to our house every weekend. Often he would bring us candy or something to eat when he came. Some Sundays, Mama would take us out to his house to see the baby James, who was now two years old and looked a lot like his daddy. Mama seemed to like the baby very much, but she was always so uncomfortable around Miss Pearl and the rest of Raymond's people. They didn't like Mama at all. Sometimes when Mama was there, she looked as if she would cry any minute. After we had come home from their places, she would cry and fuss all evening. She would say things like, they can't keep me from seeing my baby. They must be crazy. If I can't go see him there, I'll bring him home. But she only said those things. She knew she couldn't possibly take care of the baby at home and work and take care of, our, of the four of us. Once when we went out there to see the baby, he was filthy from head to toe. Okay. Mama gave him a bath and washed all his clothes. Then every Sunday after that, Mama would go there just to wash his clothes and bathe him. Raymond was, Raymond was going with a yellow woman at the time. At the same time, he was going with Mama. Wow, Raymond is just doing the most, huh? All, all his people wanted him to marry her. They didn't want him to marry Mama, who wasn't yellow and who was stuck with the three of us. Things began to get so tense when we would go to see the baby that we'd only stayed long enough for Mama to give him a bath. Then one day, Raymond went back to the service and that ended some of the tension. But Mama got scared to go to Miss Pearl without Raymond there, so she stopped going and we didn't see the baby for a long time. For those who just joined us, that was chapter two of Coming of Age in Mississippi. This is, you know, at the time that she's reflecting on her childhood, you can hear 
the thought of being a burden to the family, being abandoned by the father who um, desired to uh, rid himself of his family in, a, in an attempt to, to be less stressed, I suppose. And now the mother has gone on. She's at three children and now she's at four. She's speaking uh, belligerently towards her young child. And this young child is internalizing all of this. And we're looking at trauma in the making from childhood. That's why I think it's very important to start at childhood to see all of the things that went into the mind of the, of the child that informed their adult thoughts and conversations. So I'm going to check out chapter three. Hold up. I'm going to bust out chapter three, because like I said, uh, yeah, we're going to get through it. That white lady mama was working for her. What time is it? That white lady mama was working for worked her so hard that she always came home gripping, sorry, griping about back aches. Every night she'd have to put a rub, red rubber bottle filled with hot water under her back. It got so bad that she finally quit. The white lady was so mad, she, she couldn't get mama to stay the next day. She told mama to leave to make room for her new maid. This time we moved two miles up the same road. Mama had another domestic job. Now she worked from breakfast to supper and still made $5 a week. But these people didn't work mama too hard and she wasn't as tired as before when she came home. The people she worked for were nice to us. Miss Johnson was a school teacher. Mr. Johnson was a rancher who bought and sold cattle. Mr. Johnson's mother, an old lady named Miss Ola, lived with them. Our house, which was separated from the Johnsons by a field of clover, was the best two room we had been in yet. It was made of a big new planks, and it even had a new toilet. We were also once again on paved streets. We just did we just didn't make those paved streets though. A few yards past the Johnson's house was the beginning of the old road we had just moved off of. We were the only Negroes in that section, which seemed like some sort of honor. All the whites living around there were well-to-do. They ranged from school teachers to doctors and prosperous businessmen. The white family living across the street from us owned a funeral home and the only furniture store in Centerville. They had two children, a boy and a girl. There was another white family living about a quarter of a mile in back of the Johnsons who also had a boy and a girl. The two white girls were about my age and the boys were a bit younger. They often rode their bikes or skated down the little hill just in front of our house. Adeline Jr. and I would sit and watch them. How we wished mama could buy us a bike or even a pair of skates to share. There was a wide trench running from the street alongside our house. It separated our house and the Johnson's place from a big two-story house up on the hill. A big pecan tree grew on our side of the trench and we made our playhouse under it so we could sit in the trench and watch the white children without their knowing we were actually out there staring at them like this. Our playhouse consisted of two apple crates and a, thin can, a tin can that we sat on. One day when the white children, I'm just gonna call them the European children. <laughs> that makes it better for me. When the European children were riding up and down the street on their bikes, we were sitting on the apple crates making Indian noses and beating the tin can with sticks. We sounded so much like Indians, Nate, that they came over to ask if that was what we were. This was the beginning of our friendship. We taught them how to make sounds and dance like Indians, and they showed us how to ride their bikes and skate. Actually, I was the only one who learned. Adeline and Junior were too small and too scared, although they got a kick out of watching us. I was seven, Adeline five, and Junior three. And this was the first time we had ever had other children to play with. Sometimes they would take us over to their playhouse. Katie and Bill, the children of the Europeans that owned the furniture store, had a model playhouse at the side of their parents' house. That little house was just like the big house, painted up snow white on the outside with real furniture in it. I envied, I envied their playhouse more than I did their bikes and skates. Here they were playing in a house that was nicer than any house I had ever dreamed of living in. They had all this to offer me and I had nothing to offer them but the field of clover in summer and the apple crates under the pecan tree. The Christmas after we moved there, I thought sure mama would get us some skates, but she didn't. We didn't get anything but a couple of apples and oranges. I cried a week for those skates, I remember. Every Saturday evening, mama would take us to the movies. The Negro sat upstairs in the balcony and the uh, European sat downstairs. 
One Saturday, we arrived at the movies at the same time as the European children. When we saw each other, we ran and met. Katie walked straight into the downstairs lobby and Adeline Jr. and I followed. Mama was talking to one of the European women and didn't notice that we had walked into the European lobby. I think she thought we were at the side entrance we had always used, which led to the balcony. We were standing in the European lobby with our friends when Mama came in and saw us. Come on, come on, she yelled, pushing Adeline's face on into the door. Essie May, I'm going to try my best to... Yo, mom's was mad violent. So she threatened the girl to kill her when she got home. I told you about running up in these stores and things like you own them. She shouted, dragging me through the door. When we got outside, we stood there crying. And we could hear the European children crying inside the European lobby or the white lobby. After that, mama didn't even let us stay at the movie. She carried us right home. All the way back to our house, mama kept telling us that we couldn't sit downstairs. We couldn't do this or that with the European children. Up until that time, I had never really thought about it. After all, we were playing together. I knew that we were going to separate schools and all, but I never knew why. <clears throat> After the movie incident, the European children stopped playing in front of our house. For about two weeks, we didn't see them at all. Then one day they were there again and we started playing, but things were not the same. I had ne never really thought of them as white before. Now all of a sudden they were white and their whiteness made them better than me. I now realized that on not only were they better than me because they were white, but everything they owned and everything connected with them was better than what I was, what was available to me. I hadn't realized before that downstairs in the movie was any better than upstairs, but now I sat, I saw that it was. Their whiteness provided them with a pass to downstairs in that nice section and my blackness sent me to the balcony. Now that I was thinking about it, their schools, homes, and streets were better than mine. See, now they got her thinking. <laughs> they had a large red brick house and nice sidewalks connecting the buildings. Their homes were large and beautiful with indoor toilets and every other convenience that I knew of at the time. Every house I ever lived in was a one or two room shack with an outdoor toilet. It really bothered me that they had all these nice things and we had nothing. There is a secret to it besides being, there is a secret to it besides being white, I thought. Then my mind got all wrapped up in trying to uncover that secret. Again, because they're living in a time where you're in the thick of it and the, the parents are indifferent and they resent their, their, you know, their condition. And so they kind of stifled the voice of the child. And so she can't even, she couldn't even go and ask her mother about the European looking brothers that she had without, you know, being cursed at and chewed. And so now she's left to, uh, to her own devices to try to figure out what she's exper experiencing, which in actuality is this systematic racism. Mm -hmm. One day when we were all playing in our playhouse in the ditch under the pecan, I got a crazy idea. I thought the secret was their privates. So you can't leave children to their own devices. I had seen everything they had but their privates and it wasn't anything different than mine. So I made up a game called the doctor. You see, cannot leave children to their own devices. This is very much uh, following the line of the other research that I keep talking about. I had never been to a doctor myself. However, mama had told us that the doctor was the only person that could look at the children's naked body inside their parents. Then I remember the time my grandma, Winnie, was sick. When I asked her what the doctor had done to her, he examined me. Then I asked her about the exam, and she told me he looked at her teeth and her ears and checked her heart, body, and blood in private. Why is he checking grandma's private? That's a question. But now I was going to the doctor. I had all of them. Katie, Bill, Sandra, and Paul, plus Adeline and Junior. Take up, you see, don't use children to their own devices. Take off their clothes and stand in line as I sat on one of the apple cracks and examined them. I looked in their mouths, their ears, put my ear in their hearts to listen to their heartbeats. Then I had them lie down on the leaves and I looked at their, see, you see? She looked at their privates. I examined each of them about three times, but I didn't see any difference. I still hadn't found that secret. That night when I was taking my bath, soaping myself all over, I thought about it again. I remember the day I had seen my two uncles, Sam and Walter. They were just as white as Katie them. But Grandma Winnie was darker than Mama, so how could Sam and Walter be so-called white? <clears throat> I must have been thinking about it for a long time because Mama finally called out, Essie Mae, stop using a bowl of soap and hurry up so Adeline and Junior can bathe before that water gets cold. Mama, I said, why ain't Sam and, why ain't Sam and Walter white? Because they Mama ain't white, she answered. But you say a long time ago, they Daddy is white. 
if the daddy is white and the mom is colored, then that don't make the children white. But they got the same hair and color like Bill and Katie, them I said. That still don't make them white. Now get out this tub, she snapped. Every time I tried to talk to mama about so-called white people, she got mad. Now I was more confused than before. If it wasn't the straight hair and, and the white skin that made you white, then what was it? For those who just joined us, we are reading chapter three of Coming of Age in Mississippi. And this young girl is being left to her own devices and using her limited reasoning to find out systemic racism that she was experiencing in Mississippi. In the summer, of, in the summer, Mr. Johnson would drive down to Florida in a big trailer truck and bring it back running over with watermelons. Then he would sell them to the stores and markets in Centerville and nearby towns. Often Ms. Johnson would go with him now that school was out and she was teach she wasn't teaching. When she went, I would stay with Miss Ola. Miss Ola was a very nice old lady. She would bake cookies and candy, candy or something for us every Saturday. She had a little bell that she used to ring for us to come over when she had cooked us something or wanted one of us to help her in the yard. We always sat out in the clover on Saturdays and listened for the little bell. I learned to like Miss Ola even more than I started saying staying with her at night. She liked me so, 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 she liked me very much too. And we had lots of fun together when I was there. Miss Johnson had a shaky little rollaway bed that I was supposed to sleep on in the dining room, which was right next to Miss Ola's room. I never did sleep much on it though. Before going to bed, I had a hundred chores to do for Miss Ola. First, I had to scratch her white hair and brush it. Then I cleaned her false teeth, got water in the foot tub for her to soak her feet in and a thousand other little things. I would be about it would be about 12 o'clock at night before I got into that little shaky bed. Miss Ola, Miss Ola don't know about child labor laws, a boxer. But as soon as I got in it, Miss Ola would call me into her room and read to me. She slept in one of those old antebellum beds with big posts covered with a flowery canopy. It was high with soft, with big soft feather mattress. I had to use a stool to get up in it. Most of the time, as soon as Miss Ola started reading, I was so tired that I fell asleep. I would just look up at the flowered canopy, close my eyes, and I was out cold, sleeping down. I guess I never heard a single story she read to me. During those nights with Miss Ola, I had to access to the first bathroom I had ever used. Wow. I had never had such a privilege before. I used to go in the bathroom and sit on the stool, even if I didn't have to use it. I would just sit there and look at that big, beautiful white tub, the pink curtains that hung over it, the pink washing powder in the big, beautiful glass container, the sink with pink soap in the soap tray. It all looked so good to me. There was a small, round, pink rug in front of the stool. I would take my shoes off as I sat on the stool and just run my feet all over that soft rug. Sometimes I would stay in there so long, Miss Ola would come in to see what I was doing. After taking my first bath in that beautiful white tub, I hated our round tin tub every time I bathed in it. Y'all see me trying to hold, holding back the tears. I liked everything about the Johnson's house. There was always soft music playing on the radio as I did my little chores. The house was large and spacious with beautiful furniture all the way through it. It was everything ours wasn't. I kept trying to learn that the white folks secret from Miss from Miss Ola. When I asked her questions about it, she didn't get mad like mama, but she didn't tell me it to me, but she didn't tell it to me. However, there was one secret I learned. That was why all white women had colored women working for them, because they were lazy. Mama would clean that house up from those up for those white folks every single day. She would make the beds, dust the furniture, run the vacuum, clean the bath. Then she would cook three meals a day too. After eating the food Miss Ola made, I would see Mama. I could see Mama had to do the cooking because white women didn't know how. Dang, and and going in. Miss Ola had a cold one night when I was staying with her, and I saw her make some soup. So where's if you staying with Miss Ola, and where did where the other siblings? She was coughing, and mucus was running out her nose and dripping into the pot. That's nasty, Miss Dang, Miss Ola. What kind of snack soup? Miss Ola was so old, she had lost control of her bladder. Every time she coughed, pee ran down her legs. Then she would wipe it off the floor with a dish. 
hand sanitary, Miss Mola. Mm -mm. Awesomeness. Every time she peed, she coughed pee ran down her legs. Then she would wipe it off the floor with the dish towel. When she set some of the snotty pea soup in front of me, my stomach turned inside out. She called it the snotty pea soup, yo. Bless up, Greg. Welcome to the conversation. We are reading Coming of Age in Mississippi. It is so-called Black History Month, quotations. And so uh, in Triple to the Left Project, and I haven't read a book in a minute. I have not forgotten about you, Left Project. We're going to read this uh, little narrative here. Okay, it's not soup, it's not soup. Where are we? Every time she coughed and peed, okay, boom. Uh, her snotty pea soup in front of me, my stomach turned inside out. Now, when she would ring that little bell for us on Saturday, Adeline and Junior ran over there, but I didn't. I finally realized what Mama went, meant when she said, Miss Ola is going to kill y'all with that blink she puts. Adeline and Joel st Junior started school the second year we lived on the Johnson's place. Now that they were in school, I had a problem on my hands. Junior was only four and a half and Adeline six. Mama started him early because she didn't have anyone to keep him or for him to play with Adel while Adeline and I were in school. He wouldn't stay in his classroom because he thought he belonged with me and Adeline. I was now nine years old and in the fourth grade. Junior would follow Adeline everywhere she went. Sometimes I would look up and he was standing outside my classroom door peeping in. I think I must have taken him to his classroom at least 10 times a day. During the lunch hour, he would follow me all over the campus, holding onto my skirt tail. I would send him to play with the other boys. Then a few minutes later, he came running around a corner telling me some boy was chasing him. Hold on one minute, please. Regular scheduled programming. One moment. Oopsie. Make sure everything is good. One moment, please. We're back. I have to check on the little ones. Sorry. So, oh boy, the Junior didn't want to stay in class. Mama was seeing, uh huh, uh huh. Mama was seeing the soldier again. So, how she seen the soldier? The soldier was giving her bun. And when the husband was giving her bun, she didn't want to go back. But the soldier giving her bun and she going back. I'm confused, Mama. Mama. Mama was seeing the soldier again. He was out of the army now and he didn't wear his uniform anymore. So now we called him Raymond instead of the soldier. He was coming to the house every other night now. When he was there, he would help us with our lessons. Mama never did help us. She said she only had only finished sixth grade and she could barely read my fourth grade reader. But Raymond had almost finished high school. He could read and work arithmetic better than my teacher. I didn't need much help from Raymond because Miss Ola helped me a lot when I stayed with her. She had taught me lots of words and showed me how to spell and write them too. Because of Miss Ola's help, I made all A's in reading and spelling. In arithmetic, with a little help from Raymond, I made B's. And in no time at all, I was doing my homework without any help from anyone. Adeline and Junior were the big problems. Raymond had to work so hard with them. He would take Junior over his, his lesson eight or nine times, but Junior wouldn't remember a single word afterwards. He was a, see, this is, this. I don't even like just repeating this stuff. She called the little boy dumb. How did you know Junior did not? Anyway, Adeline wasn't a dumb, was dumb as Junior. Well, she must have learned it from her mama because, you know, now, now she called the, the two younger siblings dumb. But she didn't do much better. She thought it was funny to learn words. She would laugh the whole time Raymond was helping her. They never did learn their one, two, threes. When I was the only one going to school, mama would buy one loaf of bread a week and a jar of peanut butter and jelly for lunch. I had a peanut butter jelly sandwich every day. Now that all three of us were in school, she couldn't afford the loaf of bread. So she bought 10 pounds of flour instead of the five she had always bought. Each night she would make biscuits and, and fix two biscuits with peanut butter for each of us. I kept the lunch bag and Adeline and Junior would come to me for their lunch at 12. I remember that once I was eating with some of my classmates, I pulled my peanut butter biscuit out of the lunch bag and they laughed at me all day. 
After, why are they laughing? I mean, after that embarrassment, I never took those biscuits to school again. We ate our lunch on our way to school every morning. And so what? See, you too. Anyway, sorry. All day long, I was hungry, but it was better than being laughed at by my classmates. So what? I'm sorry. Sometimes eat, eat your food, man. Now you eat. Now you're going to be hungry by the time. Anyway, sometimes better during the lunch hour, Adeline and Juno would tell me that they were hungry. Of course they're hungry. You already ate the food from morning. And I would send them to the water fountain to fill up on water. Now they're going to piss themselves. Times really got hard at home. Mama was trying to buy clothes for the three of us, feed us, and keep us in school. She just couldn't do it on $5 a week. Food began to get even scarcer. Mama discovered that the old white lady living in the big white house, oh, this is real white, the white lady, and I'll t I've, I've said why before. I have an objection to these terms of white and black, but anyway. Mama discovered that, that the old European lady living in the big white two-story house on the hill sold clabber milk to Negroes for tw 25 cents a gallon. Mama started buying two or three gallons a week from her. Now we ate milk and bread all the time, milk with crumbled corn in it, cornbread in it. Then Mrs. Johnson started giving her the dinner leftovers and we ate those. Things got so bad that mama started crying again and she cried until school was out. One Saturday I went to get some clabber milk and the old European lady asked me to sweep her porch and sidewalks. After I had finished, she gave me a quarter and didn't take the quarter mama had given me for the milk. When I got home and told mama, she laughed until she cried. Then she sent me up there every day to see if the old lady wanted her porch swept. I was nine years old and I had my first job. I earned 75 cents and two gallons of milk a week. So they sent the little baby to go work. Soon after I started working for that old lady, I stopped drinking her milk. One evening, I was cleaning the back porch where she kept it when a little Negro boy came by to buy two gallons. She came in to get them while we waited on the back porch. She kept the milk in three old safes with screen doors. I saw her open one of them and pour some milk out of a big dishpan. Then she went out to the yard, leaving the safe door open. Now this old lady had eight cats that also lived in the back porch. About five of them scrambled into the open safe and began lapping up the milk in the dishpan. She was fussy about her cats, so I didn't even yell at them or shoo them away. I just let them eat. She'll run them out and pour the milk out. When she come back in, I thought, but when she came back, she just let those cats help themselves. And when they had enough, she pushed them away from the milk and closed the safe door. Nastiness. First snack pea soup, no licky cat milk. I stood there looking at all this and I thought of how many times I had drunk that milk. I'll starve before I eat any more of it, I thought. I could hardly wait to tell mama, but when I did, she didn't believe me. She probably gonna give the rest of that milk to them cats too. I don't think that woman would sell us milk she let them cats eat out of. Mama said, I didn't argue with her. I will still bring the milk home, I thought. Y'all can eat it, but not me. I didn't keep that job long. The big old white house had the biggest porches I had ever seen. It had a porch on the bottom and top floor circling the entire house, which gave the house a rounded look. Pretty soon, the old lady even had me sweeping the inside of the house, downstairs where she lived, and dusting the furniture. She started where she lived, no, she started keeping me up there all day. Mama didn't like that. One day she kept me up there until after dark. Mama came there and got me. What she got you doing? She have you up here all day? Mama asked me when we got home. I sweep the porch, dust the furniture, sweep the bottom of the house. I was washing out some stockings for her today, I told her. You go up there tomorrow and you tell her you ain't gonna come back no more. You hear? She been trying to kill you for 75 cents and that little, not a mother cursing the milk. <laughs> the doodle milk <laughs> she gives you. Tell her you're going to stay at home with Adeline and Junior. The next morning, I went and swept the porches and cleaned the house and stayed up there all day. When I had finished, I told her that Mama told me to tell her I didn't really want to quit working for her. I got a good feeling out of earning three quarters and two gallons of milk a week. It made me feel good to be able to give Adeline and Junior each a quarter and they have one for myself. Then have one for myself. When school started again, things were still pretty rough. So Miss Johnson got one of her friends, Miss Claiborne, to give me a job. Miss Claiborne taught home economics at the European school. I worked for her every evening after school and all day Saturdays. I really liked this job because I made almost as much as mama at nine. I'm sorry, I said at nine. 
Miss Claiborne paid me $3 a week and the work was easy compared to what I was doing for 75 cents. <clears throat> now I could pay our way to the movies every Saturday and then give mama $2 to buy bread and peanut butter for our lunch. Look at what the nine-year-old has on her mind. Okay. For those who missed the beginning of the story, when we're done, you're going to have to go back to see all that's happening up until this point. Besides that, I was learning a lot from Miss Claiborne. She taught me what a balanced meal was and how to set a table and how to cook foods we never ate at home. I never know anything about having meat, vegetables, and a salad. I enjoyed learning these things, not that they were helpful at our house. For instance, we never set a table because we never had but one fork or spoon each. We didn't have knives and didn't need them because we never had meat. Miss Claiborne was in charge of selling candy, peanuts, and hot dogs during the Friday night football and basketball games at her school. On Saturdays when I went to work, she would give me the leftover wieners and some of the peanuts and candy. Now, when I got off of work on Saturday, I would run all the way home with what she had given me. Adeline and Junior would be sitting at the street waiting on me. I'd give them some of the peanuts and candy and take the wieners to mama. On Sunday, she'd make them for us. The wieners and $3 a week that I earned kept us from being hungry at school and at home. Miss Claiborne's house, imagine $3 a week, dude. People drop $3 on a coffee. Mrs. Claiborne's husband was a businessman. The only thing I knew about business at the men at the time was that they were carried briefcases, smoked cigars, and wore suits every day. Ms. Claiborne was nice. Mr. Claiborne was nice, so I thought all his businessmen were nice. One Saturday, I was setting the table for them, and he asked me to set up a place for myself. I sat down with them, the first European people I had ever eaten at the same table with. I was so nervous, we sat in silence eating. Dessert was served and they started talking to me. Essie, how you doing? No, no. <clears throat> Essie, how do you like school? Miss Claiborne asked. Oh, it's all right, I answered. What kind of grade you make? He asked. Oh, it's Mr. I'm sorry, it's Mr. Claiborne, my bad. Essie, how do you like school? Mr. Claiborne asked. Oh, it's all right, I answered. What kind of grade you make? He asked. I make A's and everything but arithmetic and I make B's and that, I said. See, I told you she's smart, Mrs. Claiborne said. What would you like to do after you finish school, Essie, he asked. I don't know. Mama said I could be a teacher like Miss Claiborne and Mrs. Johnson, I said. Mr. Claiborne just nodded his head. When I was doing the dishes, Miss Claiborne came to help me, and she told me that Mr. Claiborne thought that I was very smart. She said she didn't know many 10-year-olds who worked to keep herself and her sister and brother in school. And after Saturday, I ate with them every time I was there for a meal. They started treating me like I was their own child. They would correct me when I spoke wrong, and Mrs. Claiborne would tell me about places she had traveled and people she met while traveling. I was learning so much from them, sick or well, I went to work. I was afraid if I stayed home, I would miss out on something. All right, we got one more page. That's chapter three, y'all. So I'm gonna finish up chapter three. Now, oh, I got so much to say. Oh, Father, help me. Just read. I came home from work one day, and it seemed as though mama's belly had got backside, mama. Cheese on bed, moms. I came home from work one day and it seemed as though mama's belly had gotten big overnight. I knew she was going to have another baby and I also knew it was for Raymond. Now she had gotten fat. He wasn't coming by anymore. He hadn't been to the house in almost a month. Again, mama started crying every night like she did when Junior was a baby and my daddy was staying with Florence all the time. Then I thought Raymond had left her for that yellow woman his people wanted him to marry. When I heard mama crying at night, I felt so bad. She wouldn't cry until we were all in bed and she thought we were sleeping. Every night I would lie awake for hours listening to her sobbing and quietly in her pillow. The bigger she got, the more she cried and I did too. I cried because I thought she would make me quit school and work full time for Miss Claiborne to take care of us all. It, the nine year old, right? It seemed as though any day she would have to quit work. I had worked late for Miss Claiborne one evening. When I got off, it was raining. I didn't have an umbrella or anything. By the time I got home, I was soaking wet. I was so mad because I had on my first new dress in almost two years. Mama had bought five yards of beautiful pink flowered material for a dollar at a bargain store. She had a lady make the dresses for me in Adeline, and we had both worn our dresses to school that day. Now mine was all wet and had lost its newness. All the way home, I was thinking about my wet, sagging dress and Adeline's new dress hanging against the wall, still looking new. What Adeline's dress had to do with your wet, saggy dress? You know what, y'all? This is why we have to correct children. 
Because, you know, these thoughts and Look at to her wet, soggy dress. When I walked in the door, Mama was singing. I forgot about my wet dress. Instead of looking depressed and sick as usual, she seemed so happy. Dripping wet, I stood in the door a long time just looking at her. I didn't know why she was happy and I didn't really care. I was just glad to see her like this. She was walking around carrying her big belly like it was a, as light as a feather. Take that wet dress off before you get a cold, she said as she knows me standing in the door. Like, hello, or hello would have been nice. Any other time, she would have said something like, look how wet you is. Why didn't you wait till it stopped raining? That night, I listened to see if she would cry, and she didn't. So I didn't have anything to cry for that night either. She walked around in the spell of happiness for three or four days. Then one evening, I came home after work and found Raymond there. When I walked in the door, he was rubbing her belly, and she was blushing down. I got so mad standing in that door, I started trembling with anger. I felt like going up and slapping his hand off her belly. Mama was laughing now, I thought, but I knew she would be crying again as soon as her belly went down and he made it big again. When they noticed me standing in the door looking at them disapprovingly, he jerked his hand away. Mama stopped blushing. They both could tell that I didn't like it. In fact, when he left, I didn't say anything to Mama. I just went about the house doing anything I could find to do to keep from talking to her. Raymond had brought some candy for us. Dang, well, they, they just want the children just to have bad teeth. Alan and Junior, you gonna bring them an apple or something, dude. Why you keep buying candy? Diabetes? Adeline and Junior were eating theirs and grinning, but I didn't touch the candy Mama had left for me. If Adeline and Junior knew Raymond had made Mama cry every night like I did, they wouldn't be eating that candy either, I thought. Later that evening, when I was taking my bath in the tin tub, Mama came in the kitchen. Without saying a word, she got down on her knees with her belly touching the tub and washed my back. She was still happy, but she knew I wasn't. She was putting a lots of soap on my back and scratching it and rubbing it good. But usually she fussed at us for using so much soap. We're gonna be moving pretty soon, she said. I sat there stiff and didn't say anything. The Johnsons probably is asking her to move because she's too big to work, I thought. She kept rubbing my back. Raven bought us a new house, she said. What? I yelled. Almost jumped out the tub, and you can quit working for Miss Claiborne as soon as we move, she said. Miss Claiborne treat me good, and I don't want to stop working for her, I said. Okay, you can go on working for her if you want to, but Ray will be able to take care of us now, she said. That's why Mama's so happy. <laughs> I cried that night because I was so happy. I cried that night because I was so happy. I no longer hated Raymond for, for feeling Mama's belly. All night I lay awake thinking of how Mama must be feeling to have somebody build a house for her after she had been killing herself for more than seven years, working on one job after another, trying to feed us and keep us in school and all. We had moved six times, wow, since she and daddy separated. Now she would have a place of her own and we were going to be moving off the Europeans place probably for good. So that is, this is, I remember when I first read it, I think it was a hurricane time and um, the lights were out and I have a number of books on my little shelf here and I picked this one off and like, I. I do. I breeze through this book because to me, it's it's really well written and it and it commands the reader's attention. It received like uh, the back says engrossing, sensitive, beautiful. So can did so honest, so candid, so honest, so touching as to make it virtually impossible to put down. And I and I would agree the way the book reads. And that was San Francisco Sun Reporter. Um. And so that is um, again. This is a. I think one of the reasons I got this book was to examine. Um, this thought of the angry black woman and how one transitions um, into what society is calling an angry black woman. Some of these conditions that oftentimes are not explored because people would rather just point at the emotional outburst or the behavior and not looking at all of the things that create this um, personality type, this type of individual who is angry. So we can see or perceivably angry. We can see that she is nine years old, and according to her, she's moved six times, okay, in seven years. And she's witnessing her mother being, uh, you know, trying her best to maintain uh, the responsibility of keeping up a family. And in that, her mother had gotten callous and her mother had gotten cold. 
and her mother had gotten resentful and indifferent. And she's noticing the difference that when that financial burden was lifted off of the mother, she was like, I don't even know why she's feeling good, but I'm feeling good and she's feeling good. You know, and sometimes we overlook all of the things that are happening with uh, the women as well as the men. And the men um, sometimes in this situation, I'll stick with this situation, when he steps off base, because he can't deal with the pressure. He left all that pressure on his own, his wife and the children. And then by extension, this nine-year-old, this seven-year-old, this five-year-old feels like she has to take personal responsibility for her siblings. That's way too much responsibility at an early age. And then so by doing, we're gonna see her journey through life. Um, again, uh, like I said, she's internalizing all of these negative things, shut up, be quiet, you know, calling her siblings dumb, all of these things are coming from her environment. And this is about a generation, two generations out of slavery. So a lot of these unhealed trauma, again, the father was upset because he's in a sharecropping situation where he knows that he, all of his work is gonna be for naught. So this is economic. We can't leave out economics when we're talking about the condition of the people and even up until this day. So we're gonna continue at chapter four, I believe tomorrow. I may start earlier and then come back and read another and another so we can move through the book expeditiously. And then, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I haven't read in a while. It has 30 chapters. So it's a smaller bind book, like a five by, so it's smaller, so it looks like a lot. So it's 30 chapters. So we just moved through three of them today. So come back tomorrow, make sure you subscribe, make sure you leave your comments below as we have this discussion. And let me know if you've ever read this book before as well. Let me know your thoughts, all right? One.